Hello everyone, it's William Hayward Painter here, and welcome to an Artist's Perspective review, the first of its kind. So, what is one of those? Well, I've had this idea for a while, which is to take a film or a TV show and talk about it from an artist's standpoint, or an artistic standpoint, looking at fine art influences, as that is what I studied in university, so I feel qualified, rather literally, to talk about movies through that lens. <laughs> I want to talk about the plot of what I'm reviewing, but also artistic influences, references and ideas from other movies too, and whatever else I feel is relevant. I'm full of little observations on this topic, and it bridges the gap between my two great loves, art and entertainment. With that said, I don't especially see this video as being the prototype for my artist's perspective reviews, not in terms of style, but in terms of subject matter at least, because today's video is not about a film, but rather a trailer for one, Jordan Peele's Nope set to be released in July 2022, COVID permitting. <laughs> I'm a big Jordan Peele fan. To see my upcoming videos about his work, feel free to like, share, and subscribe, ringing that notification bell to get notified on all updates they come through in the future. So I do enjoy Jordan Peele's first two movies, Get Out and Us, from 2017 and 2019 respectively. Even The Black Klansman, or the most recent entry in the Candyman franchise, which both of those films are not directed by him, rather by Spike Lee and Nia DaCosta respectively, though Peele has a producer credit on both projects, and similar to his work as a director, those movies are about race, or racism in particular, class and gender, and specifically about challenging stereotypes about what it's like to be black and what it's like to be white in America. In America. Yeah. All of these topics Peel is passionate about exploring cinematically, and his new film, Nope, appears to be no different, but I'll try not to speculate too wildly on what this film is about or what the twist will be. Peel loves to have a twist that reframes the entire viewing experience, and so therefore the film is then fun to dissect on repeat viewings. I'll try not to make crazy predictions about this film, at least not too crazy. Not because I'm worried my predictions would be wrong or anything like that. Upon DVD release, I'll do a full review of this film, and if my theories are wrong, I'll admit it. It's just that this trailer does its job well, almost too well, as it gives nothing away about the story, at least little about the character storyline, so there's not much to speculate on. Although, I shouldn't complain too much, as trailers nowadays tend to feed you misinformation or give too much, if everything, away about the film. The trailers for Get Out and Us suffer in this way, especially Get Out, not as the twists are necessarily all given away, but you feel like you've seen the film in under two minutes. The Nope trailer, however, is not like that. It's very mysterious and does what a trailer, or teaser, should do. Intrigue and hype the viewer up to see the film in question, kind of like it has with me. Before we talk about the trailer itself, I'll say that the first I heard of this film was the poster, released in July 2021, a full year before the movie is due to come out, and now this trailer in February 2022. So we're five months or so from release at this point. The poster is interesting. I love the blue and green colour scheme in the night sky, and the land, from when I first saw this poster. The composition reminded me of an American werewolf in London, when David Kessler and Jack Goodman are walking downhill on the Yorkshire Moors. The angles, also the tree as well. This poster is very good looking. It's dark, as it's night, but I love the depth of the colours. Very rich. John Landis' film, An American Werewolf in London, is another one where I feel Jordan Peele draws some influence from, as both their careers have their roots in comedy. Although they've made movies that have comedy in them, they've also made scary films too. American Werewolf has funny scenes. Can I have a piece of toast? Get the fuck out of here, Jack. Thanks a lot. Also scary scenes. <laughs> and other scenes that effectively merge the two styles. Hi, Jack. Hi, David. Spoilers for the trailer, but Nope is set in Southern California, in the desert, which this poster does a good job of hiding as it's dark, and it looks kind of grassy, or there's more foliage and mountains in the background, so the horizon gives the idea of it being in the north, maybe the midwest, or at least ambiguous in terms of location with the nighttime setting, as it obscures this location. I like that we see the sky on the left corner, it looks lighter blue, but as we pan up it's darker and we see the stars beyond. Which can mean only one thing, the terrifying plot of Jordan Peele's new movie is about... Aliens. <laughs> Yes, as silly as that sounds, I have my reasons for thinking so, but for now, more about the movie poster. 
The colour scheme is broken up by warmer colours like yellow and red in the lights of the settlement, centre of the composition, kind of like a theme park vibe or a ski resort with what looks like cable cars maybe? To say nothing about what's in the film, I just see what I see. I just see what I see. Yeah. It looks like fun, though it's overshadowed, literally, as we see a big grey cloud, separate from the rest in the cloudy night sky, with a trail of kites or bunting coming off it. Very interesting design, and suitably mysterious and creepy. Kind of has a face on one side. Could be a pareidolia, or meant to be a human or even an animal face. More on that soon. I won't explain why yet, but bear it in mind. So far, the only thing close to a UFO is the cloud, which I've just identified, and the kites, again identified, but it's the combination as we see it here that defies logic. Not quite surreal, it's not bizarre enough for that, but in the context of the movie it might be a spacecraft in disguise, which again, pretty silly, but it's the execution that makes it creepy, or at least fascinating. This is a good time to bring up the cast. Stephen Yoon is in the film, of The Walking Dead fame, also Kiki Palmer, who, to my dismay, I've not seen in other things, at least not yet. I'll watch stuff featuring her before this movie is out, as I'm curious. Though the trailer showcases her range as an actress. More of that in a moment. So we have both of them, but what got my attention was the inclusion of Daniel Kaluuya as the leading man, as he was the lead in Get Out, Peel's first feature, which led some, including myself, to think this could be a sequel to Get Out, as the cloud with the kites looks rather like a brain, which, major spoilers, is an important motif in Get Out. A is a terrible thing to waste. Although the trailer for Nope makes it clear that this movie has nothing to do with Get Out other than that Peel is making it and Daniel Kaluuya is the lead, or a co-lead with Kiki Palmer. Saying that, let's talk about the trailer. I mean, that's why we're all here, right? The trailer opens with a series of famous still photographs of a male African-American jockey riding a horse, assembled as a motion picture, one of the first of its kind by Edward Mybridge. Very artsy, especially the numbered stills so the sequence was properly presented, I'm sure, as well as that the celluloid burns up at the end. There's a sense of motion, but also destruction, literally. The famous aspect of this footage isn't the rider of the horse, who is pretty anonymous, which could make for an intriguing or creepy backstory or something in this movie, as I don't know who this person really was, following personal research I've conducted anyway. But this is perhaps the point, as black Americans, or people of colour in general sadly, as important as they are, are often underrepresented or just left out of history, also the arts and technological advancement which this clip encapsulates all three of those elements. One way or another, this person certainly looks confident and experienced in his equestrian training. This historic two-second clip has voiceover by Kiki Palmer's character. Did you know that the very first assembly of photographs to create a motion picture was a two-second clip of a black man on a horse? Palmer's character is ostensibly called Jill, Jill Haywood, with who I believe is her brother, James Haywood. To what I've read online, these two characters are siblings rather than characters in a relationship or marriage. Married. At least that's what I've read. For one thing, they act as if they are, as far as I can see, but also it makes for a different character dynamic, as we've had a couple, an interracial couple in Get Out, and a black married couple with two children in Us, so it appears that's what they are, but also it would be nice as it makes for a different character pairing or grouping. I have two things I'll say about their names, Jill and James. First of all, I don't like their surname. I don't hate it, but I don't like it. Forgive me for saying so, it's just a personal pet peeve of mine, as my surname is Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D, and theirs is close, which isn't the issue, it's just that sometimes I get letters in the post that spell my name wrong, for example, H-E-Y-W-O-O-D, which makes my blood boil, as it's just wrong. Good guess but wrong. I guess that their name is so close it just annoys me as it reminds me of that, but anyway, let's move on. Another thing more important to the concept or the story as I see it, it reminds me of the story of Jack and Jill, at least going by their names, but there's a slightly different spin as Jack and Jill is a European fairy tale, i.e. the characters are white children, but Jill and James are black adults, so there's a subversion there, or I can sense one, especially as Jordan Peele loves to make fun of foolish or contemptible white characters in his movies and challenge black stereotypes in the horror genre by them being the lead characters and having them make mostly the right choices. And so James and Jill are named after those characters to challenge that idea a little. That's my theory anyway. 
To add to my idea, I'll just explain a bit more. The Jack and Jill story is as follows, as since it's been a very long time since we were all at nursery, I'll just go over it. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Already there's a sense of patriarchy. Jack is the main character, status is important, and he's the first to fall, with Jill following. Up Jack got, and home did trot. Trot. Hmm, like a horse? There's an interesting observation. As fast as he could caper, went to bed to mend his head with vinegar and brown paper. Jill came in and she did grin to see his paper plaster. So she's happy that Jack is better. Although we'll read, Mother Vexed did whip her next for causing Jack's disaster. Okay, so holistically what happens here is the children are sent on an errand, calamity ensues as Jack is injured and Jill is blamed for it. When it's really his own foolish fault, or at least his fault, but their mother must be gullible enough to believe the story Jack told about what happened, and Jill gets punished for it by being slapped. I'm willing to believe that James and Jill in Nope are a satire on that story, in that unlike Jack, James is a bit sidelined, less important, or invested in what his sister is doing or pursuing, and saying that, Jill is ambitious, confident, and proud, but not arrogant, and these are admirable qualities, and so we've added another interesting leading lady in a Jordan Peele movie, Rose Armitage in Get Out, Adelaide Addie Wilson in Us, and now Jill Haywood in Nope. I'll say now, I won't go as far as to say that this film is making a feminist statement of some sort. It could be, but given my satirical theories and the closing bit of this trailer with Jill being swept up into the air by an unseen force, that doesn't challenge the Jack and Jill story with Jill getting wrongly punished for Jack's accident. It's weird, I'm not sure what's happening story-wise or what this symbolises. So the jockey in the film is James and Jill's great-great-great-grandfather, I believe. They're either two or three generations descended from him. It's tricky as Jill says great-great, but James adds in a third. Possibly as a joke, but this clip says something about their characters. Jill is upbeat, James is downbeat, good Jordan Peele comedy double act concept. Very key in Peele. There's a great sense of contrast between Edward Mybridge's silent film, shot on celluloid, documentary style, 1800s, to James and Jill on a soundstage against green screen, shot digitally, and with sound. Possibly shot during coronavirus too, as every member of the crew shooting this commercial that the siblings are a part of, it looks like, is at least two metres apart. So there's a sense of moving with the times, being progressive in many ways, literally with the horse riding, but also touching on the African-American experience, and advancement in filmmaking technology, of course. When I first watched this trailer, I wondered if Covid would be written into the film because of this shot composition. But it appears that this film isn't set in modern times, rather sometime in the 2000s it seems, going by the mobile phone James is using later in the trailer, plus the electronics company Fry's, which is now defunct, plus another easter egg I'll get into. So not too long ago, but it's a time less focused on at this point perhaps, and adds to the drama as mobile phones have kind of ruined the horror genre. Like, oh, I don't need to face this threat, I can just phone a friend. Much like in Get Out, how that looked to be combating that idea, with Chris in Get Out, his phone keeps getting unplugged so he can't call for help in the end. And James in Nope, his mobile phone signal wasn't as strong in the early 2000s like it is today. Speaking from experience here. So that aids this movie. Before we move on, I'll say that writing Covid into a film, which this movie doesn't look to be doing, well that could make for drama, but might just be a meta joke in this scene, and besides, it would undermine the extraterrestrial horror plot of this movie. A Covid horror movie is a subgenre all on its own now, and a subversive summer horror movie like this is its own Jordan Peele shaped thing, so best not try and combine them, as one of those is enough. We see Jill, centre frame on TV, which has a blue tint. Contrast to the green and the yellow lights above, also the upright surfboards off camera. Which I'm not sure what that's about, it creates a contrast to the other colours in the picture, but I'm not sure what the significance is, uh, to this scene at least, we'll come back to that as the trailer goes on. The environment that the people are in is unnatural, compared to the silent film as the racetrack environment is real, and it's like they're reconstructing it in the present day with real people, but in virtual space with green screen and motion trackers. Comically so, particularly as Jill is wearing green like the background, so she, like the background, will be augmented, though not in the way she wants. Check this out. And that man is my great-great-grandfather. Great. There's another great-grandfather.
Yeah. <laughs> She's confident, but maybe to the expense of common sense in this way, though her strong black woman archetype is admirable, particularly as she looks like the only confident, jovial, spokesperson-y character in this film at Going By The Trailer. She dances, she's cool and hip, got some of those sister locks. She's potentially more progressive than Addie Wilson's character. Uh, in a conventional sense, as Jill seems benign, where spoilers, ultimately Addie was not. <coughs> Cut to two switches, which cues the music. Fingertips, parts one and two by Stevie Wonder. He's very young singing this track, but more of that in a moment. The switches are black on a mostly white surface. There's a sense of duality, which is becoming a staple of Peel's films, often as it pertains to race, black and white as colors for material things, as an allegory for different people of different races. Also, these switches are circular. One is turned by James, just as the horses turn and trot in a circle. White and brown horses, in contrast to the black horse we saw in the opening shot. We're on the ranch during the day. We see them tied up in their pen. Reminds me of a carousel, like at the fairground. This is quite a pleasant moment as they walk and James leaves them to it. For someone less enthused than his sister, he for sure cares about their ranch. We see him on horseback on the range. He's looking after them, even if it is hard work. So that's pretty nice. It's in this shot and the next that we see what kind of looks like a field of wind socks, like at the airport, although these are all different colours than the typical red-orange wind socks and have hair and arms and blow in the wind. I believe in America they call them tall boys, or they could be a symbol for sky dancers. Hmm, sky dancers. They look silly, but Peel makes them look creepy. It's the placement of the flailing arms these things have, also the cartoon faces and spiked up hair, which vaguely gives the idea of them looking like African American people, uh, in a stereotypical sense, that is. It's the faces in particular that make me think that, however it might just be me reading too deep into this, although it is fun to speculate on what these things are, and what they mean metaphorically. I imagine they're there to indicate how windy it is on the range. Also a stimulation for the horses, maybe? Also their height and leanness makes them look like basketball players, but going back to the idea of colours, and often racial significance in Jordan Peele's films, if these were all black, it would be too obvious if that's the intention for what they're supposed to look like, and I'm willing to believe these inclusions are to diversify the colour palette of this movie, for one thing, as they're all purple, orange, green, blue, and yellow, I would imagine no Asian reference intended by that, at least not on my part. Although Stephen Yoon is in this film, and he's Korean-American. His inclusion reminds me of the Asian member of the Red Alchemist Society in Get Out, although this feels like a larger and potentially more benevolent role in this movie compared to that. But going back to the tall boys, I think it's to do with life and death, as we'll soon see. It reminds me of a documentary trailer I saw for the American painter Clifford Still, where even his abstract paintings go back to the figure in terms of design, that when we're alive, we're upright, vertical, when we die, we become horizontal. Interestingly, there's fields here on the ranch, like farmland, and the figures look like they're leaning over, tending to the land, like distorted figures in a Clifford Still painting. Or, even as slaves, out in the field, possibly. Which is interesting, but especially creepy, as it's innocent on a surface level, but something feels off here. Jill says the Haywood Ranch are the only black horse trainers in Hollywood, and they like to say that since the moment pictures could move, they had skin in the game. Yeah, skin in the game. This means a few things. As characters, but more deeply as black Americans, Jill and James, and potentially others on this ranch, are the odd ones out in the community, the town, and the horse trainer community too, as we see white tourists in this area, and Stephen Yoon again, who works here. Also, they live in Hollywood, albeit in the deserty, back-of-beyond type area, but they're well-to-do as successful trainers, and it's to do with their heritage, personal and just in terms of their own race, as black people have been there as jockeys, as athletes, since the movies were invented by white people long ago. So Jill and her family lineage are intrinsically linked with the sport. She is proud of that idea, and as well she should be. They have their own business with official logos. James has a black hat with a red H on it. H for Haywood, H for Horses. Nice little simple and ambiguous logo. Kind of looks like the H from the Courier DHL, their logo. Pretty interesting, but the main one is Haywood's Hollywood Horses. Great logo, as it's alliterative, and with the same moving celluloid of Jill's ancestor on the horse, in a clip art style bit of moving film. A little dated, but still pretty cool. Another hint that this movie is set in the past, 20 years from where we're at now in 2022. 
Before I continue, there is an idea that every 30 years things come back into style or relevance, so maybe the reason this movie is set in the 2000s, going by my theory as well as other people's, is to reference sci-fi movies of the 70s like Alien and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, even to real-life stories about various alien encounters, which is just in hearsay, but who knows. I feel there's a wish fulfillment to this movie, that black people, however sidelined they might have been in history, have their place in it, and that should be recognised. This movie, like Peel's other films, puts black people, from real life as well as in the reality of his movies, up on a pedestal, or at least gives them the limelight, which is great. As a side thing, this movie has the third major sporty reference in a Jordan Peele film. In Get Out, Jesse Owens is referenced as a famous runner. Nope has the famous jockey, famous for his image on film as a demonstration of motion at least. And Us, in between those films, has Zora Wilson who runs track. Which reminds me of Jesse Owens. Each of the three have running in common. Though two films have a real person from history as their athlete, while Us has a fictional character, but there's an established trope. Over Jill's voiceover, we see the Haywoods horse box being driven by a car. This is a very interesting shot because it reminds me of the black cars in Get Out being driven by white people, which is a metaphor for slavery, black people being driven by white people, controlled by them. This is very similar in that we have a black horse. Lots of black horses in this trailer, come to think of it. In a white horse box being driven by a white car, it's a similar image to Get Out, but the opposite, black in white rather than white in black. It's not creepy, but it's stark and harsh, the contrast. You know, the thought occurs to me that if there are that many horses in this movie, with a title like Nope, perhaps it should have been called Nay. I know, I know, I'm not the first person to make that joke, but you know what? The point still comes across. So anyway, I suspect Jill and James are from out of town, maybe not too far out, but we can see them taking the highway to their new ranch in the desert. This is the first of two visuals that remind me of The Hills Have Eyes. Bear with me on that one. We see a shot of, I think, James in the barn outside during the day, tending to a horse, plus another black man in a cowboy hat. Which is funny, this shot reminds me of a bit early on in Ghostbusters Afterlife. There's another movie with a small town setting. Ghostbusters Afterlife was set in Oklahoma, so the American South. Nope is in Hollywood, California, so similar but not the same. Both of these movies also have a wistful element for the 80s, the Spielberg-Lucas era of blockbusters, but also Stranger Things too. Which leads me to a pivotal point. Peel is enamoured with Spielberg movies, also Kubrick films. There's lots of references to them in Us, and so far this movie looks to do that too. We see a shot of a record player spinning. It's night time, nice blue and yellow lighting inside. Jill drunkenly robot dances in the house on the ranch. It's very nice in here. It's big, lots of art on the walls, ornaments, a big record collection. Very cool, very hipstery too. <laughs> Seriously though, vinyl albums have never really gone out of style. In fact, it's back in the game in a big way, which is great. Can I just comment? It's uh, more of a question, I suppose, but I'm not sure how it works in America, but in Britain, which is where I'm from, often there's not much money in training or keeping horses, from what I understand at least. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me in the comment section, please. So yes, in America, is there much money in keeping horses? If not, this again could be wishful thinking. Some black, well-to-do siblings moving into this place for work, etc. It makes for an interesting movie that explores the black experience in a different way each time, from a man's perspective, then a woman's, now a man and a woman's together. Going back to the scene, I guess the vinyl is a loose symbol for affluence, or analogue, old school, cut off from the rest of the world type stuff, as well as being kind of fancy, rather than listening to music on CD, or even digitally. It is the 2000s, that's a thing. But vinyl is cooler. Their collection puts my own to shame, man. Jill's robot dancing reminds me of the girl robot dancing in her room in Friday the 13th Part 5. Peel references Friday the 13th quite a bit in Us. From Jason Wilson, named after Jason Voorhees of course, to the scene of Zora beating up the doppelganger twins, which is as brutal and over the top to the point of comedy, similar to Tommy Jarvis beating up Jason in Friday the 13th Part 4. Anyway, as Jill dances to the music, we see her t-shirt, kind of looks like Ziggy Stardust, an alien alter ego for David Bowie, with a Stars and Stripes eye patch and a round earring, kind of like a flying saucer, I'm not sure. We see outside the house, James stands looking up at the sky. He's with a horse, a white horse this time. In the dark, it looks pretty surreal. 
Though it's not as surreal as Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, though, which is a blessing. The music continues, as does Jill's dancing. She reaches for a drink, maybe for a glass of whiskey. We see a nearby decanter. I think it's whiskey, which brings to mind The Shining. But as she's about to sip it, the lights and the music fade to black, like a power cut has happened for some reason. Power cuts at night are always creepy, and a mega inconvenience. We can all relate to that. We see an ornament of a horse, especially the legs, also some owl ornaments near the record player. Now, the owl is a symbol of wisdom. Depending who you ask, it's also a symbol for the Illuminati, as opposed to the all-seeing eye. Again, depending who you ask. But this moment, I think, symbolizes wisdom and logic fading away into the dark. All bets are off now. Also, owls are nocturnal. There's an idea that what is different or bad for us people might be good for the animals, or something like that. It puts them up on a pedestal. Also, there's a photo, possibly of Jill's ancestor again with a horse. I think it's a white horse. Hard to say as the photo is black and white. And this shot quickly fades into darkness, and the sound of the record slows down, distorted and creepy. It reminds me a little bit of Gremlins, when Mrs. Peltzer switches the record player off and the sound distorts. Very memorable. A song high above a tree with a voice. This next shot of the house at night is a good time to bring up the cinematography. It's gorgeous. This movie was shot in IMAX for select sequences. Gives it a nice wide look. Hoyt Van Hoytema is the cinematographer. He's worked on a couple of Christopher Nolan's recent films, Dunkirk, Interstellar, and the upcoming Oppenheimer with Robert Downey Jr. So this movie will look spectacular. Nolan's another director who loves Stanley Kubrick films, especially 2001 A Space Odyssey. As the lights fade out, we hold on this shot in the darkness, in the quiet, very creepy until text appears from the top down, from Jordan Peele, and the music swells unsettlingly. This whole bit is a direct homage to The Shining, of the opening scene with the credits appearing from the bottom scrolling up. In fact, this farmhouse with the barn, the whole setup for this movie is similar to The Shining, as I think it's supposed to recall the Overlook Hotel, although this movie is kind of the opposite of that movie. You know, instead of an isolated location in Boulder, Colorado, we have an isolated town in Hollywood, California, in the south rather than the north. No snow, but the sandy desert. Great inversion, Mr. Peel. The Shining is a great, iconic movie to reference in your horror movie. Not only because it's well made, but it's great. Referenced in Ready Player One, also in the sequel, Doctor Sleep, directed by Mike Flanagan, of course. But if I might go off on a tangent for a second, like I've never done that in this video before, as much as people like The Shining, I've heard there are some people who don't find that movie scary. <laughs> I disagree. I'm terrified by scenes in that film. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. So I think that's why Peel's films tend to get me. Lots of shots similar to Kubrick. And just the rewatchability, lots of details to pick up on on repeat viewing. The Shining, in fact, Kubrick's whole catalogue is worth talking about. Stay tuned to this channel to see me cover it all one of these days. So, back to the Nope trailer. Another thing about the blackout is it reminds me of Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where all the lights go out in the neighbourhood, as due to alien activity. This is where it gets confusing, in terms of continuity at least, because we see James and his horse outside, they're further away from the house in this this two shot. Then a reverse angle of James, he sees what I think is a neighbouring house. It's very oddly shaped, like a spacecraft almost, which is a stretch, I know. But I think it is just another house as its lights are on, but those two fade out. Here comes the scariest bit of the trailer for me, in terms of sound design. As we hear the wind whistle mixed with a scream, it doesn't sound human though, it sounds more like a horse. Then we abruptly cut to James looking back as his horse whinnies and bolts back across the range to the house. The lights are still on, so there's a continuity error there. But you see, the horse knows what's up. It's creepy and weird out and the horse be all like, no, and runs away. The correct thing to do. There's a moment from Lil Rel Howery in Get Out that pairs well with this clip. Leave, motherfucker! <laughs> Seriously, though, ominous titles are shown this summer. 
which is usually a nice thing. You know, fun summer blockbuster, get you excited. But this is a horror movie and looks to deconstruct that idea. So it looks to chill you rather than thrill you, in a typically Spielbergian way, that is. Which again brings to mind Friday the 13th. Those are horror movies, but set in the summertime. The thing about this trailer, as with Us, is the use of music. Although this trailer doesn't do a creepy remix of the song in question, it does, however, add variously dark, atmospheric sounds to Fingertips by Stevie Wonder. Although I wondered if Michael Abels, who again does the score to this film like Peel's other stuff, did remix this song, but it is just the same song again with a darker edge to it. Effectively so. From the moment the From Jordan Peel text came on screen from the top down, this trailer encourages you to look up as reflected in the characters. We see James and Jill, and a third character named Kevin, played by Brandon Perrier, fearfully looking up at the sky. Jill wears pink, while James has kind of a blue-gray jumper on. That use of pink and blue, possibly in terms of gender, reminds me of young Addie's clothes in Us a little bit. Kevin, who I assume is also the driver of the Fry's truck, the now defunct electronics company, his t-shirt says Earth, and I think we see phases of the moon around the Earth on his shirt too, which brings up the possibility of alien invasion in this film, but also of light and dark, by way of power, electricity, as the aliens seem to affect lights going on and off somehow. The clothing of everyone in this trailer I think bears significance somehow. Lots of references to different animals. James has a great trailer line. What's a bad miracle? They got worth for that. It's a good question. Ignites a mystery, while also being a biblical, or at least more vaguely a religious reference. Although this movie, unlike us, might not have references or strong themes like that as such. Get Out did, but it was way more under the radar. Not like us, with a quote from the Old Testament. Also references to God and heaven and hell. I tried to Google antonyms for miracle and didn't have much luck. I guess if a miracle is good and from God, a bad miracle might be called a curse, although those are from God too, according to scripture. This film looks to have a sci-fi theme, so I feel evil, unexplainable magic from the devil is off the table. I don't think there's any supernatural element in this film, and it's James's way of justifying these unexplainable happenings as best he can. He's faced with the unknown, and he's scared. Aired. Going back to the story, though, if this film is about aliens, which I believe it to be, there is something to be said for perceived alien sightings, about how it's only really been reported since the invention, proliferation of television and radio, that UFO sightings have increased, or come to exist in the first place as we know them today, and that aliens all look like the greys, grey-skinned, big-headed humanoids with black oval eyes, lean bodies, etc. I'm willing to believe that this is a dark satire on all of those ideas, as Peel artfully references all of these things in his trailer. From UFOs to aliens to photographic evidence of aliens, but also Earth animals too. Hmm, think there's a connection? I sure do. I'll explain. As the drums drum, we see Steven Yoon's character, named Brian, from behind looking skyward. He's dressed in a red cowboy suit. It reminds me of the clothes Marty McFly wears in Back to the Future 3 when he's traveling back to 1885, the bright colors. Brian's clothes are heightened for comedic effect with all the red and white, two colors from the American flag. I wonder if he's part of a rodeo act, as he has an audience, it looks like, and a horse next to him, in a glass case. There's a black tarpaulin, which is pulled away to reveal the horse in its enclosure, which reminds me of Damien Hirst's work of cows and other animals preserved in formaldehyde. Great image to have in mind while looking at this. The creepy thing, though, is that when I first saw this trailer, the tarpaulin either blew off, or some unseen force, once again, blew it off. <laughs> But I can confirm it's being pulled off by a rope, so I know how this happened. It's the why that still evades me. Mystery box, mystery box, mystery box. Next, we see a row of tall boys upstanding, but they all fall down in the wind, like they're passing out or dying. They're in a different environment this time, near a car centre in town. The sun's setting, and we see the street lights coming on. Got a green hue on one of the lights there. The thought occurs to me that maybe these tall boys are to do with the colours of the rainbow, or the colour of light. Them falling suggests light being turned off, the day is ending. What the tall boys symbolize here is either all about rest or death. They're also something the aliens seem interested in, somehow. 
Now here we come to a very important image in the trailer. We see a load of plush alien toys which look like the greys, the shape of their heads, though their eyes are rounder, scarier, and with black uniforms and little oval badges. I wonder if the aliens have visited us before and asked they be remembered by having merchandise made of them or something. Story-wise, I have no idea, so I'll leave that part of it there. But this moment feels like a dark satire of summer blockbusters to me, of the subsequent merchandise that stems from movies like this, from Star Wars to Jurassic Park and beyond. But instead of it being likeable and nice, it's kind of disturbing. It reminds me also not of Jason from Us, but his doppelganger, Pluto, who wears a mask like these alien heads, which which again brings to mind Jason Voorhees. Speaking of masks, we see an alien mask called an alien viewer, like an artifact, but I'm not sure if this is an actual alien head or just a mask that you can see stuff through maybe, like a kaleidoscope. We see a little alien later in the trailer walking towards James at night, blink and you'll miss it. So the aliens might look this way, or it's just a hoax. Maybe they look creepier underneath that weird mask. So either this is a mask or an actual head of one of them, Pretty messed up stuff. The text that reads Alien makes me think of the poster for the Ridley Scott film. This shot darkly makes fun of merchandise, of souvenirs one collects on holiday as a tourist, from the t-shirt to the green stones, the toys and the mask, with the book your next experience here, either meaning your next look at Brian's horse show, or with the aliens, possibly both. Another thing about this moment is, like the opening shot, it includes a lot of green, with the stones and the t-shirts, especially the outdoor seating as well, also with a bit of yellow too. So one of those colours, or both, could be the main colour of this film, similar to how Get Out used a lot of blue, and Us used a lot of red as its main colour. So that's another Jordan Peele trope, and it diversifies the colour palette from movie to movie. The next shot is very fascinating. It reminds me so much of Electroma, the art film by former French duo Daft Punk, with a motorcyclist on a white bike in the desert. Again, I suspect there is significance in colour, especially with his silver chrome helmet. It's the silver helmet and the desert setting that reminds me of Electroma, but also this person. If it is a person, it might be an alien. Looks like Thomas Bangalter, or the silver-helmeted one of the two. This biker, could be a highway patroller, has a digital camera with a long lens pointed up at the sky. Also, we see a solid black circle, like a disc or a flying saucer again, reflected on the shiny surface, or it's part of the helmet somehow. It's fascinating to look at and ponder this image. It's like this person is documenting activity coming from the sky. We hear the song, Fingertips. Stevie Wonder does a call and response section to the crowd, Say Yeah, who cheers back to him. It's quite an ironic choice, as this movie is called Nope, so yes is the opposite to no, which creates a contrast. It's a funny idea, though Peel makes it tense and creepy, as James, or another rider, we don't see their face, falls off their horse. It's not scary, but it is a little disturbing, as the horse doesn't flinch or react to this. Another rich visual from the trailer is the family gathered on the front row. They were watching Brian's horse show, now they too are looking skyward. Maybe that's part of the show. Maybe not. We see that we're at or near Vasquez Rocks, going by the sign behind the crowd of people, an iconic Southern California location. We see a mum and dad and three children, two sons and a daughter, all white. A nuclear family? Nah, there's three kids, not 2.5. As I look at this, there's something interesting about the colours these people wear, and their possessions, which I think is a comment on family structure and gender stereotypes, challenging them, but also confirming them at the same time. We see two of the three kids have red cowboy hats, red like Brian's suit, which brings to mind the twins in Us, which itself is a reference to the Grady girls in The Shining, even though it's a twin boy and girl, or at least brother and sister. But looking closer, one boy has a shotgun toy, which is like a cowboy and Old Westy, therefore, also a symbol of masculinity. The mum wears a t-shirt with an ostrich on it, which is an interesting choice, more animal symbolism. We've got horses, which are mammals, then owls and ostriches, which are both birds, in this film. I have a theory about this shirt, not what it means, which is nothing on her part, but it's helped me form my theory about the aliens. 
What is it? I'll let you know soon. We also see the dad has a t-shirt with Universal Monsters on it, I think, which is funny as this movie is produced and released by Universal Pictures. We've got Frankenstein, the Wolfman, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon in a parody of a police lineup, I think. This is similar to the Tethered in Us, which references 80s slasher monsters, but this shirt has Universal Monsters, so it's more studio-specific, which is narcissistic. The other thing I noticed is the binoculars the family has. The boy with the gun has a green pair, good red-green contrast. The parents have black ones, and then the boy and girl have a blue and pink set, respectively. There's another blue-pink reference, also a gender thing. Pink for girls, blue for boys, sort of a thing. Sort of a thing. Yeah. Speaking of gender, notice up in the top left, we see a woman with a solid pink veil, sitting still. We'll come back to her. The binoculars are for looking at things from afar, no question about that. So I suspect they'll use them to get a better look at the extraterrestrials. Also, the girl has one of the alien toys on her lap as she sits. We see a transition of humans looking skyward to machines doing the same thing, with a lone white security camera at night looking up into the sky. I'm assuming it's unaffected by the power outage, unless this is happening on a separate evening. That's the thing about continuity, I'm not sure how many days this movie will take place on. Us was over the span of two days, with a sprinkling of backstory to justify what's happening in the present time. We'll definitely need that for this film to justify the alien disturbances. This security camera kind of reminds me of HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This idea of technology watching over us, looking out for us. Perhaps this camera will do what it's meant to do and not go self-aware on us, Terminator style. It's subtle to see, but James, and possibly the security camera too, are tracking a moving UFO at night. Looks like a typical flying saucer. The design is very minimal, not too scary, but it's the subtlety that makes this moment work. So now we come to the moment of the trailer that made me say, Oh, that looks scary. It's the woman from the rodeo. She has a blue shirt and sun hat with a pink veil, like a bride. She reminds me of Georgina from Get Out, just the antiquated look of this person, looking at both of their clothes. The woman stands up, and as she does so, we see her face revealed. So, I'm not sure if this is makeup or they hired an actress with facial burns or some kind of disfigurement. I doubt it, but no disrespect intended to this person. But honestly, this is one of the creepiest things in the trailer. It's the way her teeth are so protrusive and the way her hair is cut awkwardly. Maybe she's uncomfortable with her face that she cuts it herself so she doesn't have to show it. I don't know. But the uncanny valley is in full effect here. That's what makes it creepy. Possibly the second scariest thing in this trailer? Wait for it. We'll get there. As off as this is, again, no offense, she seems just as interested in what's going on in the sky as everyone else is at the rodeo. Warning, animal lovers, look away now. During the day, we see the ranch is all foggy as the sun comes up. James, or someone else, I'm not sure as he's silhouetted, wanders around outside. Looks like a storm has happened. This shot is similar to the shadow puppetry in Candyman, though of course done in live action. There is a cartoony nature to the shadow puppets in the Candyman cutaways, which this has too, but it's much more disturbing as we see what looks like a black horse embedded upside down in the car that towed the horse box, which is pretty sick. Said horse box has the license plate on the top rather than the bottom, which is another look up visual in my opinion. It's like an inversion, up instead of down, and goes along with looking skyward for aliens or just abnormal things. This next shot is very artistic, similar to the home invasion starting point in Us, where we see a crab walking sideways in the living room of a doll's house, one with a pink chair and a blue sofa. Those colours again. This calls back the home invasion ideas in Us, but it abstracts it, where instead of people invading a house, it's an inhuman force invading a house. Also, it reminds me of the spider crawling on the glass table in Us. It unites our alien invasion disruption plot while adding another animal to our quota. Speaking of which, the next shot is of a reptile eye opening on celluloid film. Like the opening shot, this frame is square-shaped, like it's letterboxed and pillarboxed, black and white, or at least washed out in terms of colour. Low frame rate like before, there's a starkness again as it's black and white film, specifically with black lizard skin and a white eye, though it blinks with two eyelids, one looking more red than black, watching intently, like the aliens, I'm sure. This image also reminds me of the ring, which again has a close-up of a horse, a horse's eye. So, we have humans, aliens, horses, owls, ostriches, crabs, and lizards. Or mammals, extraterrestrials, birds, crustaceans, and reptiles. If there's any connection? Yeah, this next shot explains my theory. 
What we see here is a shot of a human hand, a white person, looks like they're wearing a clown costume, which reminds me of child Michael Myers in Halloween. I'm not sure what this environment is, it's all out of focus. Looks like a nursery, like we're under a kid's bed with the colours. Lots of yellow light. It makes this moment creepier. I mean, apparently yellow in a kid's room upsets them. Parents, bear that one in mind. There's conflicting information out there, trust me. The young child reaches over to a hand, reaching from outside. It's very ambiguous, because it looks human but not. There is a slight goofiness as going back to Gremlins, or rather Gremlins 2. It looks like a Gremlin forearm, as designed and made by Rick Baker and his team, the colour, texture and detail. Speaking of which, this limb, it looks like a human hand, but also like a horse hoof at the same time. It looks like a black person's hand, mixed with a black horse, as it's hairy in an animalistic way. It's either human, as it has an opposable thumb, and it's making a fist with a thumb sticking out, although I've practiced doing that pose and I can't make it look like that. So those fingers are more likely a hoof and a thumb. In other words, this creature is a mutant hybrid of a human and a horse, which is disturbing enough, but the child is reaching out to the creature for a fist bump to greet it, similar to Chris reaching out to Logan for the same greeting in Get Out. There's something off about both of these moments. It's interesting that both these shots get me hooked on wanting to see this Jordan Peele movie. So Jordan, keep putting awkward, creepy fist bumps in your movie trailers and I'll line up and go and see them. So for one thing, this interaction is so weird and unsettling, it gives off Stranger Danger vibes to me. Makes her want to pull that kid away from that thing. If it is a mutant, it reminds me so much of the Hills Have Eyes remake, where a child gets abducted by the mutant family in the desert. Though thankfully the child is returned to safety, so if that's what that bit led to, I hope it's the case for this film. I suspect it will be. You don't want this film to be too much of a downer. Peel's movies are scary, but they're not terribly depressing, and that's the appeal for me. This moment also reminds me of the I'll be right here scene from E.T., compositionally anyway, though this being does not look to come in peace. Kind of like the xenomorph in Alien. That's part of the subversion of the summer blockbuster that this movie is doing. But what is it? Is it a weird horse-human mashup? I think so, but what has it got to do with the aliens? Are the aliens creating these composite beings? What for? Disruption of the food chain? Forcibly changing which species is the apex of creation? I think so. We see lots of different animals in this trailer, but we're focused on humans and horses. I think the aliens are merging them. It's why I think that the woman with the hat, as sometimes you see horses with kooky sun hats, isn't human totally. She's a hybrid. It's the face, nose, neck, eyes, hair, and teeth that make her look more like an animal. Which is so bizarre, but I can see Jordan Peele potentially doing this. We see a horse on a t-shirt, standing on its hind legs like a person, against the yellow light like in the human horse shot. As for the person on the motorbike, are they human or a hybrid too? Hard to say at this point, but there's definitely bizarre happenings going on in California. More so than usual, anyway. At the start of this video, I said I wouldn't make predictions for Nope that were too crazy, so this is the cutoff point. Aliens are creating new mutant species out of humans and horses, and potentially other animals too, like we've seen in the trailer. Fine. Could be why Brian had that horse. Was he giving it up for abduction? A sacrifice? Unsure, possibly. Next, much like the shark in Jaws, we see the alien, uh, except we don't completely, which is what makes it scary. James encounters the alien, and he can do the smart thing, either phone a friend or back off and run. He's doing both. Good man. This is another good moment to bring up the Stevie Wonder song in the background. The fact it's sung by a young him gives a sense of innocence, him leading a crowd of adults in a cheer, which is scary when juxtaposed with the woman with the veil, also all the weird visuals that quickly pass by. We see how tall the aliens are here. We see the top of their head and their eyes, and looks like they have weird little ears too. The height is like that of a teenager, even a child. It's the song in the trailer that suggests a perversion of innocence, but only by way of like haunted dolls or creepy evil children in horror movies. It references that movie trope, but it's hard to see if there's anything else behind it, like if this is allegorical for something bigger. I know I'm reading very deep into this trailer, what all these symbols mean, but it's so vague, it's fascinating. Their look is eerily accurate to the stuffed toy version we see. 
it could be a comment on race, as the aliens look almost human, Caucasian with their pale grey-white skin. Also consumerism too, in a darkly satirical way, but that's all I can fathom. I'm not sure what the plot of this movie will be. This movie looks to have a lot of interesting themes and ideas for its horror narrative. We have a duo moving to the desert in California. They keep horses. There's something weird going on. Activity in the sky, power outages, weird mutant creatures. And it's all to do with aliens. Fine. I'm comfortable saying it's to do with aliens, as much like how US, the title is US, which could mean United States. Nope could stand for Not of Planet Earth. Nope is a funny movie title, but I'm not sure if it's an abbreviation. It sounds ominous and justifies the alien threat we're up against here. There's a lot of unexplained phenomena, but especially unconnected. Any one of these would be enough for your movie. I'm not saying they shouldn't all be together in the same story, I'm just curious how it's going to gel together story-wise, particularly as the next few shots show Michael Wincott's character, Craig, caught in a dust storm, which is a very real issue out there and enough to strike terror into the hearts of the residents, which it does here with Craig, causing him extreme fear and upset. Are the aliens doing that? Do they control the weather telekinetically too? I'm very unsure what the plot of this movie will be, but if I were to guess, aliens are trying to change the environment on a local level, and also make weird hybrids out of at least two different species, for some reason. We see James with an orange hoodie, reminds me of that alternate ending in Get Out of Chris in Jail, where we see a reference to The Mummy Returns from 2001, with Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Scorpion King. Great movie, which sets the time period for one thing, but especially it adds to my mutant species theory. We see a crab in this movie too. Maybe that's another weird crossover we'll see. The aliens might be here to invade or mess up our ecosystem. Could be a comment on global warming and the self-destructive nature of people maybe. Are the aliens trying to teach us something in a twisted way? We see James in his car at night looking up at the sky. There's a storm that wasn't there before. Looks like wind, lightning. We have negative flashes and rain coming, not from a cloud, but running off a cloud, like the alien craft is cloaked to blend in. It's very weird and abstract to look at, especially with the bunting, those kites hanging off the ship. The ship kind of looks like an eye, reminds me of the Suicide Squad with Starro at the end a little bit, though a lot less goofy in a weird way. This is also weird, but more unsettling than anything else. As a side thing, it's not in this trailer, but there's a shot in the TV spot for this movie that has what looks like a well, which again brings to mind the Jack and Jill story. I hope this isn't in the movie as much, as what's interesting in this film is the threat comes from above, whereas us, their threat was subterranean. We've seen that kind of thing already in a Jordan Peele film. Hopefully it's just something in passing, not the focus, as actually, going back to us, the idea of a horror threat from above, that idea was planted at the start of that movie, with the storm in Santa Cruz. So it's best to concentrate on that stuff, not much else, but that's just my opinion. With all the weird and disturbing stuff in this trailer, Jill Haywood has a great trailer line. Yeah, nah, nah, nah. Which is funny, or delivered while scared, but with comedy, also referencing the movie title. She's seen weird stuff and is just like, nope. Her hair and clothes look a bit different to the scene where she's dancing. Maybe this is a separate evening. Looks very 2000s, got that headband and sister locks. Vaguely, it reminds me of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Not that. It's like lightning disappeared. More like that. Anyway, like many smart black women in Jordan Peele's movies, she urges, I assume James, to hightail it out of there away from the danger. <laughs> We see James during the day on his horse, black this time as he runs, and a big wide shot of a cloud, or likely a spacecraft, hovering after him. As it does so, the tall boys in the desert fall in its shadow, which is creepy and shows the aliens affecting the environment, messing around with nature and life. The last two shots we see involve Jill inside during the day. She's in a room in the barn full of saddles for the horses and other stuff like that, and it's like an earthquake is happening as the room is shaking. It's the dust storm outside, but the shaking of the room makes it seem like an earthquake. Jill is wearing green again, plus yellow as she has a bandana on. She has a t-shirt with the number 2 on it. 
I'm not sure at all what that could mean. She's not second to her brother James or anything, but these shots make her less important. You see the leading lady swept up into the air by the wind as she screams, which is terrifying. Also a little unfair, as so far we've not seen male characters in the trailer treated similarly to that. To me, it's a little unfair in that way. And much like the Get Out and Us trailers, the end or near ending of those movies gets spoiled by the trailer. In other words, I hope this isn't Jill's fate. It wouldn't be a good end to such an upbeat, hip and with it character. Or at least it would dissatisfy me. This movie seems very utopian with its characters. It wouldn't be right to do them a disservice unless it helps make some kind of statement. I can respect that, but I still wouldn't like it. So that was the trailer for Nope. Good use of music at the end. As we see the release date for the movie, it's like Stevie Wonder is getting us excited to see this new movie. I'll be going to see it, but I'm scared out of my wits by this trailer. Here's another weird observation. That date, 7-22-22, oddly it reminds me of 11-22-63, the Stephen King book. I haven't read the book or seen the J.J. Abrams adaptation. It's just something about those dates that sticks with me. The marketing for this movie goes way old school by having a website for the film, www.nopemovie, very 2000s, keyword nope. In keeping with the time setting of this film, nothing much is on that site right now, but stay tuned, I'm sure. Well, those are my thoughts on Jordan Peele's Nope. I hope you enjoyed my video, as long and out there as it was. I'm really looking forward to this film. I plan on seeing it multiple times to pick up on all the easter eggs Peel loves to put in his movies, all the social commentary too. Again, I hope you enjoyed my video. Feel free to check out more of my content, and also feel free to like, share, and subscribe to William Hayward Painter, ringing that notification bell to get notified on all updates as they come through in the future. You take care, everyone.